Good evening, everyone. Let's open in a word of prayer and we'll get started. Father, thank you for this time we can meet together. We thank you for your word. And we pray that the time spent tonight would be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The first question is, how should we respond when people say, judge not, in response to a gospel presentation? And the idea there is, so you're making a gospel presentation and someone says, judge not, how should you deal with it? And I'll, I'll, I'll start with this observation. There are verses everyone knows not because they care about what the Word of God says, but they want to quote those verses to further their own agenda. So I'll give you an example. Get 1 Timothy 5.23. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 23. And I've had folks with substance abuse problems quote 1 Timothy 5.23 to me. And it says, Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake, and thine often infirmities. And people want that verse because say, look, there's a Bible command to drink wine. So don't be judging me and don't be telling me what to do because the Bible says to drink wine. Well, read the verse. Drink no longer water, but use a little wine. So how much wine are you supposed to use according to this verse? A little. And then notice the reason, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. So it's a medicinal use of wine. That's what it is. It's not a justification to consume large amounts of alcohol. It's not a justification for non-medicinal uses. But people quote that verse not because they care about understanding the Word of God, but because they want to use it to further their own agenda. And what I'm going to suggest to you, go ahead and get with me Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. When people quote, judge not, judge not, that's what the Bible says. What I'm going to suggest to you is they are more interested in their own agenda than actually understanding and adhering to what the scriptures say. So notice Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. Judge not that ye be not judged. Let's get Luke 6, verse 37. Luke chapter 6 and verse 37. Judge not, and ye shall not be judged. Condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned. Forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. So what people will do is they'll say, see, the Bible says to judge not, so leave me alone. Don't bother me is how they use the verse. So a couple things to consider as to how you might respond to that. Point number one is notice the verses they don't quote. So get Luke 12, 57. Luke 12, 57. Luke 12, 57, Yea, and why even of yourselves judge ye not what is right? How come no one ever quotes that verse, which is an instruction to judge, isn't it? Why even of yourselves judge ye not what is right? Get John 7, verse 24. Why do people quote some of the verses on judging, but not the other verses on judging. Because they have an agenda. They have a purpose. And the purpose is not to understand what the Word of God says. Look with me at Judges, or excuse me, John 7, verse 24. John 7, 24. Judge not according to the appearance, notice this, but judge righteous judgment. Well, that's a command to engage in judgment, and to do so in a way that is righteous. But people obviously don't quote those verses because it's not the agenda that they're trying to further. Point number two, go back to Matthew 7, verse 1. Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. 
And what I want to do is I want to read the verse that people commonly quote, but then I want to read the verses that follow after. So Matthew 7, verse 1, Judge not that ye be not judged. And that's what people love to quote. Well, let's look at verse 2. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. So notice what happens when you read the context of Matthew 7. Is Matthew 7 really a command not to judge, or is Matthew 7 a command not to judge hypocritically? It's pretty obvious when you read the context, it's an instruction not to judge hypocritically. Now notice this, look at verse 5 again. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. That's not an instruction not to judge. It's just not. It's an instruction not to judge hypocritically. Get with me Luke 6, verse 37. Luke chapter 6 and verse 37. Now let's read the whole verse. Judge not, and ye shall not be judged. Condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned. Forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. And what I'm going to suggest to you that verse means is that it is an instruction that under the kingdom program, you have to forgive first in order to obtain forgiveness. Let me prove that to you. Get Matthew 6, verse 12. In Matthew 6, we'll look at the famous, the Lord's Prayer is what it's called. And it's commonly prayed today. But let's look at it and let's understand what it says. So Matthew 6, verse 12. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Under the kingdom program, a person's obtaining of forgiveness from God is dependent on them first forgiving their fellow man. So someone in the kingdom program that doesn't forgive their fellow man cannot obtain forgiveness from God. How do I know that? Read verse 14. Matthew 6, 14. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. How does it work under the kingdom program? In order to get forgiveness from God, what do you first have to do? You first have to forgive your fellow man. Is that the way that things operate during the dispensation of grace? Before you can get forgiveness from God today, do you first have to forgive your fellow man? Get Ephesians 4, verse 32. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse... 32. Ephesians 4, 32. And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Do you see how the order is completely different? In Matthew 6, you, someone needed to forgive others in order to get forgiveness from God. Ephesians 4 says... God hath already forgiven you, and since God has forgiven you, what should you then do? Forgive others also. The order is completely different. It's not the same. I like to say that grace is front-loaded. 
In other words, what happens is God freely gives you the blessing by grace, and then you should live out that blessing in your life as the appropriate response to God's grace in your life. So point number two is simply this. The judge not verses do not mean what the people quoting them want those verses to mean. They're simply quoting them because they want those verses to suit their own agenda. So point number three, it is not judging someone to share the gospel with them. And so let me explain that. What does the word gospel literally mean? Good news. So is it judgment to share good news with someone else? It's not. Look with me at Romans 5, verse 18. Romans chapter 5, verse 18. Romans 5, 18. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Well, the word gospel means good news. When you're telling someone the gospel, you're telling them about a free gift. That's not really judgment, right? It's, it's the offering of a free gift. Get 2 Corinthians 5.18. 2 Corinthians 518. Now, I suppose people will say that, but you're, you're telling people they're sinners, and you shouldn't do that. Well, if someone has a deadly incurable disease, should you withhold that from them to preserve their feelings? What would you think of a physician that looked at your test results and they're horrible and said, hey, it's all good. No worries. Don't sweat it. it. It would be a dishonest and it would be an unloving act to give people false assurance. Look at me at 2 Corinthians 5 verse 18. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. So the ministry of reconciliation is attempting to reconcile people to God. It's not judging them. Look at verse 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So point number three is simply this. It's not judging someone to tell them the good news, to tell them that salvation is a free gift, to tell them how they can be reconciled to God. It's something that they ought to rejoice in. Point number four is this. We are not the judges of our fellow man, but the Lord Jesus Christ will be. Get Acts 17, 31. Does someone on the earth need to worry about Dave Reed passing judgment on them? Would anyone care? Would anyone even know? No, they wouldn't, because who, who would care? It just, it, why, there'd be no reason to care. But notice Acts 17, <coughs> part. Acts 17, 31, pardon me. Because he hath <coughs> appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. So who's going to judge the world? It's going to be Jesus Christ. And of course, what happens is, if you reject the gospel, then you are being judged by the person who died for your sins, and that's who you have to give account to. One thing to 
you know, just ponder about that. When the Lord Jesus Christ dies on the cross, whatever you think the population of humanity has been since Adam, a hundred billion, pick the number. Whatever that number is, that's a big number. And then you think of all the sins that that hundred billion people committed, right? All those sins, including the most awful of them, right? Christ died for them. So Christ endured God's wrath against all of that sin. For a man then to say, I'm good. I don't need Christ's sacrifice. I'm basically a good person. When they reject that provision that Christ paid for them and he endured that wrath for them, they then have to face him as their judge. That, that should be a very sobering thing to think about. So people don't need to worry. People, it, it, it's a mistake to worry about your, your, your fellow man judging you with regard to the gospel because what am I going to do? I can't control your internal destiny. I can't pour out wrath upon you. No one cares what I think. But what happens is when you reject the gospel, then the Savior who died for you now becomes your judge if you don't resolve that during this life, and you have to give account to him. <clears throat> That's a very serious matter. So what I'm going to suggest to you is this. When someone quotes Matthew 7, 1 or Luke 6, 37 in response to a gospel presentation, it is a defense mechanism because they don't want to hear the gospel presentation. Don't judge me. Don't tell me that. Well, it's good news, first of all. It's not judgment. By, by the way, the lost man is headed for judgment whether you tell him or not right? It's inevitable. It's coming. And what you're trying to do is to help him avoid having to face that judgment. So you're not judging him. You're trying to give him a get out of hell free card is, is really what you're doing. So my suggested response to this is simply this. Maybe you come up with something better. If I could show you from the scriptures how you could have the free gift of eternal life, would you want to know? And here's why that's a great question. If the person says yes, then they've given you permission because they've said, I want to know. And if the person says no, it, it's, a, it's a, frankly, a dumb response that will weigh on their conscience. In other words, if someone says to you, can I show you how you can have the free gift of eternal life from the scriptures? Everyone just say, well, absolutely, eternal life as a free gift, that sounds like a pretty good deal. So I'd like to hear about that, right? And if someone says no, they know in their inner man that they are rejecting truth that they should not reject. We're not responsible for people's reactions. I can't control whether someone believes. You can't control whether someone believes. We're simply responsible for pre presenting the truth in a way that is kind and gentle and patient and honest. That, that's our response. So let's go to the next question. How do you respond to people who say that the body of Christ is found in Old Testament typology? So here's what this question is. The body of Christ is a mystery. The dispensation of grace is a mystery. So for a moment, let's hide the chart. So if you were in Acts chapter 8, and someone said, draw me the timeline of history, what would it look like? It would look like exactly that. Because the dispensation of grace had not been revealed, the mystery had not been revealed, that's what it would look like. Now, of course, we know, since we live on the other side of Acts chapter 8, where 2,000 years later, we understand that the dispensation of grace has been revealed. The mystery uh, committed to Paul has been revealed. The question that's being asked here is some will say, well, wait a minute. The body of Christ is found in Old Testament typology. Okay, so let's consider this. My first comment is, how do you know that your typology is correct? Because typology is always symbolic, right? It's always, uh, it's always a figurative application of something in the Old Testament. And, and the simple fact is, it's common for people to think that certain things are types or symbols and simply be an error. 
The next thing I'll say about that is this. What someone claims is a type cannot prevail over what the Word of God directly says. So why does that matter? Well, look with me at 1 Corinthians 2, verse 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 7. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 7 gives us the scriptural definition of a mystery. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom. When you see the word even used like that, when, when things are even, they are equal. Okay? So when it says even the hidden wisdom, it's telling you that the word mystery means the same thing as hidden wisdom. Put simply, a mystery is wisdom that God hid until the time that He chose to reveal it. That's what a mystery is. Get Ephesians chapter 3, verse 3. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 3. How that by revelation He made known unto me the mystery. People will say, well, Paul preached the same thing as Peter. He just came along later. That's just not what the Word of God says. The Word of God says that the mystery was a revelation given to Paul. So to say that the mystery was taught prior to being revealed to Paul is disbelief in Ephesians 3.3. Because Ephesians 3.3 says it was given to Paul by revelation. Now notice what it says. As I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Verse 5, which in other ages was not made known. Is there any possible way Scripture could be clearer on whether this was known in the past? I mean, it's explicit, which in other ages was not made known. Unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto His holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Those holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit are the holy apostles and prophets in the body of Christ. They're obviously not the twelve. And you know that because when you read what happens in early Acts, they're not preaching Paul's gospel. If you think that Peter and Paul are preaching the same gospel, then what do you do with Acts 15 where they have a huge argument over Paul's gospel? Well, you're saying this, and I'm saying the same thing, so let's argue about it. It, it doesn't make any sense. There is an argument in Acts 15 because they are not saying the same thing. Now look with me at verse 6. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body. Ephesians 3, 6 is about the body of Christ. In other words, it's about the church that is being formed today during the dispensation of grace. When it says the Gentiles shall be fellow heirs, is that the same thing that the Lord taught during His earthly ministry when He told the woman of Canaan that she was a dog? When He said to her, it's not meat to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. Was He saying she's a fellow heir or was He saying you're actually a pet? <laughs> That's what He was saying. Or, or, or worse, right? That, that's what he was saying. He wasn't saying that the Gentile woman was one of the children. Ephesians 3, 6, when it says, fellow heirs and of the same body, it's about the body of Christ. So now take Ephesians 3, 3 and Ephesians 3, 6 together. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body. In other words, Ephesians 3 teaches that the body of Christ is the mystery revealed to the Apostle Paul. So when someone says, well, wait a minute, I read the Old Testament and the body of Christ is revealed in typology, the body of Christ cannot be revealed in typology if Ephesians 3 says it was a mystery. That would mean Ephesians 3 was wrong. That would also mean in verse 5 when it says, which in other ages was not made known, it would mean that was wrong. My point simply is this. It is an error 
to look at, a, at something in the Old Testament and say, well, I think this is a type of this thing over here, when Scripture specifically says this thing over here was a mystery which in other ages was not made known that was hid. You're just allowing your own ideas and conjectures to prevail over the Word of God. Now look at verse 9. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things in Jesus Christ. Well, does verse 9 indicate that you can read about the body of Christ in the Old Testament? Or does it in indicate the exact opposite of that? That from the beginning of the world it was hid in God. It doesn't say it was hid in the Old Testament. It says it was hid in God. So when people say the body of Christ was revealed in the Old Testament, Scripture says it wasn't. So what should we do? Should we go with your typology? Or should we go with Ephesians 3? And obviously it's safer to go with Ephesians 3. There is no verse anywhere that says the body of Christ was revealed or foreshadowed in the Old Testament. Let me make one further point on this. You know how human nature works? If you have a really good secret, something that's really fascinating, you know what happens with humanity? I'm just itching to tell someone. And so you hint at it. Well, I can't tell you. And you want someone to drag it out of you because you want to share it. And you know how this is. People have a hard time keeping secrets. Does God have a hard time keeping secrets that he has purpose to keep secrets? No, he doesn't at all. So if he says that it's hidden wisdom, if he says that it was hid from the beginning of the world, then it was. Let's go to the next question. You ready? Is Eve a type of overcoming Christians who will get to reign with Christ? So let's think about this. With types, there is a difference between a type that Scripture specifically mentions and a type that people think they see. Follow what I'm saying there? Look at me at Matthew 12, 39. Matthew chapter 12, verse 39. Matthew 12, 39. But he answered and said unto them, an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Well, based upon Matthew 12, you can say that Jonah is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ, at least with regard to the three days and three nights, because Scripture says it is, right? He calls it the sign of the prophet Jonas. Get with me Romans 4, verse 1. Romans chapter 4 and verse 1. What shall we say then that Abraham, now notice this, our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found. Well, Abraham is in type a father, but obviously Gentiles largely are not his descendants. Okay? My point is there are types where Scripture will come out and tell you there is a type here that exists. And when Scripture tells you that, you can be confident that it exists. But let's consider, for example, is Eve a type of overcoming Christians who will get to reign with Christ? So we're going to do a little search here together. We're going to pull out Blue Letter Bible, and we're going to run a search on Eve. Okay, so she's in Genesis 3, Genesis 4, 
2 Corinthians 11 and 1 Corinthians 2. So that's all that Scripture has to say in terms of Eve. Now let's do 1 Timothy 2.13 real quick. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And, and, and 1 Timothy 2 is going to talk about Eve being deceived. Go with me to 2 Corinthians 11 verse 3. And uh, by the way, I've got this set on the wrong thing here. I was using the NIV last time. I didn't reset it. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. So here's my question. Is there any verse anywhere in Scripture that says that Eve is a type of uh, overcoming Christians who will get to reign with Christ. The only two verses outside of Genesis that we see where Eve is mentioned, she was deceived. So what's my point? Where did the idea that Eve is a type of overcoming Christians come from? And the answer is it didn't come from the Word of God. It came from people projecting things onto it. This is why my encouragement is when you're dealing with things like types and symbolism, people see what they want to see. Rather than go by what people think they see, you should find a verse that tells you to think that way. And if there's no verse that tells you to think that way, then honestly, it's just your own opinion is what it is. Next question. During the seven-year tribulation period, will Israel and the tribulation saints be back under law? Will salvation by grace not be available? Clearly, based on Matthew 25, verses 40 to 46, salvation has to be earned through works of feeding and clothing the brethren. So let's look at the chart again. So when we look at at what's going to happen after the rapture. So let's just notice this. What will happen after the rapture is that the prophetic program that was in place before the dispensation of grace will pick back up. Let me put it this way. When God inserted the dispensation of grace into the timeline of history. Did God say, all those things I promised to do, I'm not going to do them, I changed my mind. Is that what he said? Or did he say, everything I've promised to do, I will do, but there is a temporary period of uh, amnesty. There's a delay in the pouring out of judgment. There's an opportunity for people to be reconciled. But he didn't say that he wasn't going to do everything that he said he would. If, if he had said that, frankly, it would have meant that a bunch of those prophecies never came true. So when the dispensation of grace ends, the resumption of the prophetic program has to occur. So let me ask you this question then. If that logic is true, then what gospel is preached after the rapture? The kingdom gospel, because what gospel was preached before the dispensation of grace started? The gospel of the kingdom. So the gospel that was preached before the dispensation of grace started has to be the same gospel that, was, that will be preached after the dispensation of grace ends. So let's see if we can prove that. Matthew 24, Matthew 24, and we'll look at verse 14. Matthew 24 and verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. So Matthew 24 is the Lord's Olivet Discourse where he's talking about the, the signs of his coming. It's absolutely clear that after the rapture, until the second coming, the gospel of the kingdom is preached. So let me ask you this question. Go ahead and get Acts 21, verse 20. But let me ask you this question. 
when the gospel of the kingdom is preached, is the law then in effect or is it not? So in other words, when the gospel of the kingdom is preached, let's say after the cross, did the Old Testament law go away? Did people quit teaching it? Acts 21, verse 20. Now, of course, Acts 21 is long after Acts 9. It's long after Acts 15. Acts 21, verse 20. This is James speaking in Jerusalem. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous of the law. So when Peter and the twelve were preaching during the book of Acts, were they preaching the Old Testament law? The answer is yes. They were preaching the gospel of the kingdom, but was the, the law in effect? The law was in effect. Now think about this with me just for a moment. There's the Old Testament, or the Old Covenant, and the New Covenant. When does the Old Covenant cease? And the answer is the Old Covenant ceases when the New Covenant begins. So when does the New Covenant begin? It begins at the Second Coming. Right? Yes? Anyone believe that? Get with me Hebrews 8, verse 8. People will say, well, the Old Testament, or the New Testament started in Matthew 1. Well, hold on. Get with me Hebrews chapter 9. Let's go to Hebrews 9 first. What people will do is they'll turn to Matthew 1. They'll say, look, here's a page. It says the New Testament. So here's where the New Testament begins. Well, let me ask you this. In the first century, when the early church was making copies of the scriptures, was there one guy that wrote the New Testament title page and he made copies and he sent it around to all the churches and says, look, when you're a assembling the Word of God together. I made the page that goes in between them, and so slot this in the middle. In other words, that New Testament page, you realize, is a printer's device. That's what it is. It, it's not a doctrinal statement as to when the New Testament begins. Look with me at Hebrews 9.15. And for this cause, He is the mediator of the New Testament. Who is the He? Jesus Christ from verse 14. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is of force after men are dead, otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. So the easiest question of the day is this. When does your last will and testament take effect? Yeah, it, it takes effect at death. It can't take effect before that. So, if Jesus Christ is the mediator of the New Testament, Hebrews 9.15 says he is, could the New Testament have started in Matthew 1 when he was a babe? No. It couldn't have. It can't start before the cross. Now, let me ask you this. So, some will say, okay, well then, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it started at the cross then, Dave. Well, it can't start before the cross but did it start at the cross? Look at Hebrews 8, verse 8. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. So God's going to make this new covenant. This is future. This is Hebrews 8, 8 is a quotation of Jeremiah 31, by the way. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. Because they continued not my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. Now read verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind, and write them into their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people, and they shall not teach every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For all shall know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Well, did Hebrews 8, 8 through 12, did that happen anywhere after the cross in the book of Acts? 
Not even close. There's nothing like that. Now notice what verse 13 says. This resolves the issue. In that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. You can decide when the book of Hebrews was written. I think it has a late writing. I think it's one of the last of the New Testament books to be written. So think about that. Hebrews is one of the later New Testament books to be written. And what does it say about the new covenant? It says that the old is ready to vanish away. Well, if it's ready to vanish away, what is the one thing it definitely has not done? Has it vanished away? It's not going to until the second coming, because when you read what it says there, I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. All shall know me. When does that happen? The second coming. It doesn't happen before then. Follow-up question on that. Will salvation by grace be available during the 70th week? Salvation is always by grace. No one is ever saved by works. So salvation is always by grace. Salvation is always by faith. Hebrews 11, 6, without faith, it is impossible to please him. Salvation is always on the basis of Christ's shed blood. Was there ever anything else that could actually satisfy man's sin debt? So no matter where you are on the timeline, salvation is always by grace, it's always by faith, it's always on the basis of Christ's shed blood. But does the content of the faith differ? Was Noah saved by believing Paul's gospel? No. The content of the faith differs. What also differs is the required response. And what I mean by that is this. Today we manifest faith without works, meaning you believe the gospel and you're saved in an instant. What would have happened if God gave, gave the revelation he did to Noah and Noah said, I believe by faith the revelation you've given me, but I, I just don't feel inclined to build an ark. I'm just not interested that reaction would have evidenced unbelief, right? If God says, I'm going to flood the world, here's the design for an ark, you build this ark and you'll be delivered, and someone says, well, I believe that, except I'm not building anything. Then what they're telling is they're, they're revealing that they don't actually have belief. Furthermore, under the kingdom program, how long are you required to believe? When you manifest faith during the dispensation of grace, what happens the instant you have faith? According to Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, you're sealed by the Holy Spirit on the day of redemption. So when you have faith during the dispensation of grace, is it possible for you to ever become unsaved? You can't because you're sealed by the Holy Spirit. It's not possible. But Matthew 24, 13 says, but he that endureth to the end the same shall be saved. So what happens under the kingdom program? If you believe, 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 and then fall away. That's a problem, isn't it? Because what's required there is continuance in the faith. Look at me at James 2.20. We'll get, get Ephesians 2.8 and then we'll do James 2.22. Ephesians 2 and verse 8. So Ephesians 2.8 explains how salvation works today. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now Ephesians 2.10 makes clear that we are his workmanship created unto good works in Christ Jesus. So should a believer have good works post-salvation? Obviously, Right? But what role do works play in salvation? None. Now compare that with James 2.22. 
James chapter 2, verse 22. James chapter 2, verse 22. In this chapter, James is talking about Abraham. In verse 22, he says, Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. That's really well written. The Holy Spirit did a nice job with that. Because Abraham was not saved by works. But did he need to perform works so that his faith was complete? Yes, he did. It wasn't that the works saved him. In other words, did God look at Abraham's works and say, well, Abraham, your sins are this many, and so your works have to be at least this many, and as long as your works are this many, then I'll save you. Well, that's not the way salvation works, right? One sin would take you to hell. It's not that Abraham was saved by works. It was that Abraham had faith, and that faith was made perfect by his works. Okay? So what will happen, so knowing all that, knowing how salvation works today, and knowing how salvation works after the rapture, should you get saved today, or should you not get saved today, wait and get saved during saved after the rapture, because who wants the easy way? You might as well make it a challenge. That would be an enormous mistake, right? The thing that you should do is you should solve the existential threat of hell immediately, if not sooner. Next question. Would God hold a believer accountable at the judgment seat of Christ if the believer did not get baptized or did not regularly practice the Lord's Supper? So get Ephesians 4, verse 4. The first question is, does God think you should get water baptized today? Ephesians 4, 4. There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. How many baptisms are appropriate during the dispensation of grace? One. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, please. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. So this, the baptism that 1 Corinthians 12 describes, it's a spiritual baptism into the body of Christ. It has nothing to do with water. Get Romans 6, verse 3. Romans chapter 6, verse 3. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? What all those verses tell you, during the dispensation of grace, there's one baptism. It's a spiritual baptism. It places you into the body of Christ, and it's a baptism into Jesus Christ, specifically into his death. Well, if there's only one baptism today, and that's what it's like, what does that tell you about water baptism? It's not something that God intends for us to do today. It simply isn't. Now, let's say what happens is you get water baptized. And by the way, I've been water baptized twice. I was water baptized as an infant. And you know what that accomplished for me? Absolutely nothing. You know how much faith and understanding I had when I was an infant? None. I got wet. They dried me off. And there was nothing spiritual that happened. There was no impartation of grace to me. There was none of that. It was just a religious ceremony. Then, later on when I came to faith, I got water baptized. And you know what that did for me? Nothing. Nothing. Did that place me into a, a Old Testament kingdom of priests as part of the nation of Israel? No. I, I was actually in a pool. I was in a pool. They dunked me, got out, I dried off, and I was exactly the same before I got in the pool, right? Because water baptism doesn't accomplish anything for us today. Well, what about the Lord's Supper? 
So the first question was, would God hold a believer accountable at the judgment seat of Christ if the believer did not get water baptized? No. In fact, he'd prefer you not get water baptized. Well, what happens if you do get water baptized? Fine. That's one moment. Go on. But I wouldn't make a career out of practicing an institution that God doesn't want you to practice. That would seem to be a bad idea. So what about the Lord's Supper? Get 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. Some will say that the Lord's Supper is not something that should be practiced for today. What's commonly said, most of, of the church will say, there are two ordinances today for the church, water baptism and the Lord's Supper. Well, water baptism is obviously not an ordinance for the church today. What some will then say is, well, just as water baptism isn't for us today, well, the Lord's Supper isn't for us either. If you notice the language of verse 23, for I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. And Paul then talks about the Lord Jesus, same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. Where did Paul say that he got the Lord's Supper from? Did he receive it from the practices of the kingdom church? Or did the Lord reveal it to him? Well, how many things did the Lord reveal to Paul that he doesn't want us to teach and believe? Now look at this language. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. Does that phraseology remind you of anything else that Paul says? Look with me at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. 1 Corinthians 15, 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. <coughs> By which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Now notice the language in verse 3. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. Doesn't that sound very much like 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three? And what's the subject Paul's talking about here? How that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried and He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Well, if you want to say in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three that that revelation is not for today, then to be consistent, you ought to go ahead and say the same thing about 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3. See my point? Both of them have the same language of Paul delivering unto man what he received from the Lord. Well, in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3, that's the gospel that we preach today, isn't it? Christ died for our sins, was buried, rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Well, if that's information to de for today, then why would you say in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three 23 that that's not for today when the very similar phrasing is used? Go back with me to 1 Corinthians 11, verse 25. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 25. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye, notice the next part, as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. So does Scripture give you a prescribed frequency for the Lord's Supper? It doesn't, right? It doesn't say every month. It doesn't say every week. It doesn't say any of those things. It says, as oft as ye drink it, which means you have liberty to decide. So you should, you know, think through what, you know, each assembly should think through what frequency they think is, is appropriate because Scripture doesn't give a specific rule. But does Paul describe the Lord's Supper with a similar description as to what he described his gospel in 1 Corinthians 15. And it seems he, he clearly does. Let's do one more. Does Romans 8, 9 mean that if we ever do things of the flesh as Christians, then we don't have the Spirit? Get Romans 8, verse 9. Romans 8, verse 9. But ye are not in the flesh... But in the Spirit, 
if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. One of the proofs that the fact that the fact that you do things of the flesh doesn't mean that you don't have the Spirit is 1 Corinthians. What happens in 1 Corinthians 5? There, there's a matter significantly grave that Paul says, you have to put this person out of the assembly. Did Paul say, you have to put this person out of the assembly because he's lost? Didn't say that. He, he need to put him out of the assembly so that he would repent of his behavior. But he didn't say that he was lost because he committed sins of the flesh. Get with me Romans 7, 14. Romans 7, 14. Romans 7 is a very real chapter about what you will face in your saved life. Romans 7, 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. Verse 16. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. So did Paul at times do things that he would not? That's what it says. Verse 17, now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. That's the nature of the problem. You know what you have in your physical body? That's where sin resides. Verse 18, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. Verse 19, for the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. It's a sad but true verse. Verse 20, now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. There is a, a, a believer ought not to sin. There is no reason for the believer to do that. But the reality is, I'm just going to tell you this, your body, sin resides in it. Paul had situations where there was the good that he knew he should do, and he didn't do it. There were situations there was evil that he knew he shouldn't do, and that he did. I was going to tell you that you're probably going to have a similar experience to Paul because you have sinful flesh just like he did. Okay, there was one follow-up question. Does Ephesians 2.2 mean... That, that since as Christians sometimes disobey God, that we are under the influence of a demonic spirit when we disobey. I don't think it necessarily means that. So let, let me ask the question this way. Can a believer today be possessed by the devil? The answer is no, for the obvious reason that how can a devil possess someone in which the Holy Spirit dwells? How's that going to work? Is the Holy Spirit going to say, yeah, come on in, there's room? That's not going to happen. So can a believer be devil-possessed today? No. But can a believer today believe a doctrine of devils? <coughs> yes, get 1 Timothy 4, verse 1. We've talked before about how the essence of all warfare is deception. Famous quote from The Art of War by Sun Tzu. And you understand that. In other words, if you're engaged in warfare, you don't telegraph or communicate to the enemy what your plans are because the enemy would be able to defeat them. So if that's the case, as Satan wars against the body of Christ and he wars against humanity, does he come out and say, hey, I want to tell you how I'm attacking and what I'm doing. Or does he try to confuse humanity as to what he is doing? People have the idea that what devils do today is they haunt houses, they make, um, they make objects fly around the room, they make the church bus not work, they do all these sort of sensational visual type of things. But 1 Timothy 4.1 says this, now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits 
and doctrines of devils. What do devils actually do today? They have false doctrines. So people are under the influence of Satan, not in the sense that they're possessed by devils, because they're not, but they are under his influence when they believe false doctrines, false doctrines of devils. And I'll just you know, consider whether this is the case or not. But if you think of all the things that corrupt the gospel of Christ, Calvinism, lordship salvation, work salvation, uh, you can lose your salvation if you do this. There's, there's, you know, think of how many different contaminations of the gospel. Where do those originate from? I think they're doctrines of devils. There are, they are attempts, they are devilish attempts to hide the gospel of the grace of God and thus prevent people from being saved. And that's where some of his most intense warfare is because he hates people being saved. It's, it's instructive that in Ezekiel, Satan is comforted by the multitudes in hell. He can't change his destiny. Satan is going to end up in the lake of fire. That, that, that can't be changed. There's nothing he can do about that. But he takes comfort in how many souls are there with him. It's a wicked thing, but it's a reality. So what does he do during the dispensation of grace and other times? Corrupt the gospel that's in effect, because if you corrupt the gospel that's in effect, you, present, you prevent people from coming to the saving knowledge of the truth. That's one of the most common areas of the doctrines of devils. We are at time, so I will close us in a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for this opportunity to meet together. We rejoice in your word. We rejoice in your grace. We give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.